Santos is quitting politics. Well, actually, politics quit George Santos. The House of Representatives will not be the same without George Santos. And by that, I mean staplers, letter openers, and computers will no longer have to be chained to their desks. Santos won't be roaming the halls anymore. He was one of the greats, but he's saying goodbye to Congress. He's had enough because of a minor technicality. He got caught. But who did he really hurt? I'm not sure. He, he stole money from his campaign war chest. So basically he stole from people who donated to his campaign. Now, by humiliating him, by prosecuting him, are these people ever going to get their money back? No. So it's not like you're helping them by humiliating him. And quite frankly, these are Republican donors from Long Island, New York. They deserve to be hurt. Essentially, he stole money from Republican donors. He stole money that had already been stolen. Your Honor, what did these people, and I'm being generous when I refer to them as such, what did these people think would happen to the money they donated to Congressman Santos? They were donating to buy a political favor from him once he got elected. What he chooses to do with that money is nobody's concern as long as he kept his end of the bargain and delivered on the donation. But if you throw him out of office, how is he going to repay the donation with a political favor? I would go so far as to say George Santos buying an Hermes scarf with his campaign cash adds far more to society than using that same money to jam the airwaves with another asinine attack ad filled with soon-to-be-broken promises. At least George Santos put his campaign cash to good use. Not only that, but he was also kind enough to say yesterday, I'm not seeking another term in Congress because the Justice Department is seeking a prison term for me instead. And I see that as a lateral move. So he's quitting Congress. But that wasn't good enough for the Republican jackals. No, they want him gone tomorrow. So we may be seeing history in the making. Only five members of Congress have ever been expelled from the House of Representatives. Now, three were expelled during the Civil War, and that doesn't count because I didn't have time to find out who they were. The other two were Michael Myers back in 1980, someone else I never heard of, so he doesn't count, and James Traficante in 2002. Uh, I only remember him for his toupee. And so this is... George Santos is, he's breaking ground here. He, it's a first as far as I'm concerned. It's the first time they're going to expel a congressman who, who matters to me. I mean, this guy Myers and Traficante, they got nailed for bribery. But George Santos didn't take any bribes. He didn't lead an insurrection on January 6th. If he had, he'd be speaker by now. No, this 35-year-old embattled first-term Republican congressman from Long Island, New York, is about to become only the sixth member of the House kicked out for something as minor as stealing from the Cretans, the Republican Cretans who donated to him. I mean, really, if you can't steal from your own donors, why even bother seeking elective office? So Santos, on Thursday, announced he will not be running for re-election. This on the heels of a scathing House, House ethics report, which rather rudely concluded that George Santos exploited every facet of his congressional campaign for his own personal financial gain. He's a Republican. Why else would he be running for Congress because he's a patriotic American who wants to help people? 
The, El the ethics report says George Santos used campaign donations to go on a $4,000 shopping spree at Hermes. The man bought one scarf at Hermes, and now they want to hang him with it for a scarf. It gets cold in Washington. The man needed a scarf. Yes, a $4,000 Hermes scarf. Yes, why a $4,000 Hermes scarf, you ask? To match his $6,000 Dolce & Gabbana gloves. You don't want him to look like a farmer, do you? He's a United States congressman, and it gets cold in Washington, D.C. He also used uh, the money that was donated to pay for something called adult cam shows on OnlyFans. Now, I guess I'm an aging baby boomer. I have no idea what that means. Adult cam show on OnlyFans. That is just word salad to me. Adult cam show on OnlyFans. Oh, okay, I think I know what this is. It's kind of like the site Amon, where Hungarian businessmen send money through PayPal to watch me on Zoom mopping my kitchen floor while I wear nothing but a black Speedo, a sombrero, and nipple clamps. Okay, so I get it. So you can do, you can do that on... I can also do this on OnlyFans. Okay, good, I learned something. So that's why they're expelling him? For supporting young and up-and-coming performance artists like me? Who is he hurting? He's helping people. Now, there are like six members of the Republican caucus who gave maps of the Capitol on January 5th to January 6ers, and they're running committees right now. Like, they're the, the top level of the Republican caucus. But Santos reaches into the tip jar, pulls out a few singles for himself. Suddenly, he's Charles Manson. I, I really think they're piling on with this guy. First, he's got enough problems, okay? For example, he was just indicted by the Justice Department for embezzling from his own campaign. Is that possible? C can you be charged with embezzlement from your own campaign? It's not like he embezzled from Mike Johnson's campaign. He embezzled, I mean, that would be wrong. That, you know, if he embezzled from Steny Hoyer's campaign, that's not his money to embezzle. But embezzling from your own campaign, since when is that a crime? Embezzling? That means he didn't hire the right attorneys. That's all it means. One, polit one politician's embezzlement is another one's fact-finding mission to the Cayman Islands. All depends on what kind of lawyers you got. The indictment included 23 counts, including conspiracy, wire fraud, false statements, falsification of records, aggravated identity theft, credit card fraud. I think they've mistaken him for an employee of the Trump organization. I mean, they're just piling on this poor guy. And, you know, what, what are we talking about here? Ro wire fraud, conspiracy, false statements, Compared to everyone else in the Republican caucus, I consider all those charges tantamount to jaywalking. Well, it takes two-thirds. It takes a two-thirds vote in the House to expel a sitting congressperson. This is a vote he already survived, and now the question is, will he survive another vote? I mean, he's already said he's not running for re-election. Do you have to throw him out? Well, it looks like they're going to. It looks like they're going to vote to expel him after Thanksgiving. Looks like they have enough votes to remove George Santos, which means he would leave Republicans. If he is thrown out, Republicans only end up with a two to three vote majority until an election is held to replace him. The House Ethics Committee is expected to file a motion to expel George Santos later today 
and it looks like Speaker Mike Johnson will support it. So I'm going to support George Santos. And I'm, I can't send him money, but I will send him a 50% discount on my adult cam show that I do for Hungarian businessmen. He can get 50% off. It sounds like he could use it. Santos called the ethics report, quote, a disgusting politicized smear and a grave miscarriage of justice. He added, quote, if there was a single ounce of ethics in the ethics committee, they would have not released this biased report. I am humbled yet again and reminded yet again that I am a human and I have flaws, but I will not stand by as I am stoned. He's stoned? Oh, as I am stoned by those who have flaws themselves. I thought he was like me right now. Well, we're going to miss George Santos. He's one of the greats. He truly is. This is the mop-up for November 17th, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. Share it and subscribe to my newsletter and my channel and leave a comment. Please correct me when I'm wrong. In California, a jury inside a federal courtroom found the 43-year-old man who bludgeoned Paul Pelosi over the head with a hammer guilty of attempting to kidnap Nancy Pelosi, the then Speaker of the House, as well as assaulting an immediate member of a federal official's family. Now, this happened about a year ago. You would think Megyn Kelly, Jesse Waters, Laura Ingram, Charlie Kirk, Tucker Carlson... You know, they all trivialized this attack and said it sounded fishy. They said it sounded suspicious. Some of them said, what's going on? Why is Paul Pelosi allowing a young man into his home at three in the morning when his wife is in Washington, D.C.? This is San Francisco. And a couple of them suggested that this guy who hammered Paul Pelosi on the head was a male escort hired by Paul Pelosi, and it all went bad. Well, turns out he was a a deranged, mentally ill, homeless person. And so you would think people like Jesse Waters, Megyn Kelly, Laura Ingram, Charlie Kirk, Tucker Carlson, they would apologize. They would correct themselves for making Paul Pelosi's brutal attack far worse for him and his family, but they will never correct themselves. They never say, I made a mistake. They never apologize for libelous conjecture because to fascists, political violence is a joke. It's a joke to them. In Minnesota, a federal judge sentenced the man who attacked Democratic Congresswoman Angie Craig inside an elevator. He was sentenced to more than two years in prison. In February, Congresswoman Craig, Democrat, got into an elevator in her Washington, D.C. apartment when the accused and convicted man proceeded to punch her in the face, smash her against the wall, and hold her in the elevator against her will. The Congresswoman said she threw hot coffee in his face and was able to escape. He later pled guilty and is reportedly suffering from severe mental illness. Now, Congresswoman Angie Craig, Democrat, said after her attack, people on social media mocked the assault. Well, of course they would. Why else else use Twitter if you can't trivialize women being assaulted? They accused her of lying. They doxed her. They posted her home address, and she began to get death threats, which forced her to break the lease on her Washington, D.C. apartment and move away. A government shutdown was averted late Wednesday night when the Senate passed a clean continuing resolution by a vote of 87 to 11. Only one Democrat, Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado, voted against it because it provides no funding for Ukraine. 
The continuing resolution was pretty much identical to the one coming out of Speaker Mike Johnson's House of Representatives. So we should expect President Biden to sign this maybe today or tomorrow. According to the two-step continuing resolution conceived by this creepy speaker, funding for the government based on four spending bills will expire on January 19th. Then funding on the other eight spending bills expire on February 2nd. There are 12 pending bills, 12 pending bills that make up the 2024 budget. The continuing resolution will keep spending at 2023 levels, and then when we finally get a 2024 budget passed, then we start spending at 2024 levels. Here is where the budget process stands right now. This is the nuts and bolts of democracy, something I don't pay attention to. I don't pay attention to my own budget. It's too scary. And they don't want us paying attention to where our tax dollars go. And I've made a promise to myself and to my listeners that we will learn the budget process because it is, it is democracy. You don't need a violent revolution to change things. Learn the budget process and you can move mountains. So this is where we are. The House has passed seven out of the 12 spending bills, right? I'm going to, I know I repeat, but this is, you need, the budget is comprised of 12 appropriations bills. There was a law passed in 1974 that changed the way the budget process works. They divided the entire federal government into 12 separate appropriations bills, okay? Right now, the House has passed seven out of 12 spending bills and sent them to the Senate. They are the Defense Bill, the Department of Energy and Water, uh, Homeland Security, the Department of Interior, they passed the uh, Environmental Protection Agency bill. There's a one appropriations bill that covers the EPA and the Department of Interior. There's another one appropriations bill that covers the legislative branch that's been passed in the House. They passed the military construction bill that's coupled with the Veterans Affairs bill. The uh, State Department appropriations bill has been passed. And what's left in the House are five bills, the contentious spending bills. These are, these are the ones, honestly, that are fun to watch because they argue over these bills. Uh, these are bills for, say, the Labor Department, Health and Human Services. They're still being debated inside the House as Republicans keep attaching these pro-gun, anti-LGBTQ writers to these bills. I talked about that uh, I think yesterday or the day before. So that's where we are in the House. Johnson has five more appropriations bills that he needs to get up to the Senate. Meanwhile, the Senate has passed three of the eight bills that the House has sent to them, okay? Three of the eight, and uh, that's three of the 12 overall. Am I doing this right? No, the, the House passed seven. I'm sorry. What do we got here? The House passed seven. They need 12. They need to pass five more. The Senate has passed three of the seven bills that the House has sent to them. And they have 12, nine more bills. Um, I think... You all know what I'm talking about. Uh, You're ahead of me on this. That's me drinking water and calming down. Okay. So the Senate has passed the uh, bill that funds the Department of Agriculture. They passed the bill that uh, that appropriates for veterans affair and military construction, and they passed the appropriations bill that covers 
the Department of Transportation and the Department of Housing, Urban and Development. And those three bills that have passed the House and the Senate now go into conference committees where representatives from the House and the Senate sit down and they craft three new bills. Uh, they compromise, they figure out, right? They pass, an agri they pass an agriculture bill in the House and an agriculture bill in the Senate. That bill goes into a conference committee in the House and the Senate, comes up with a final bill that is then voted on again in the House and the Senate and then sent to President Biden's desk for his signature. Like I said, this is lifting up the hood of our democracy and learning how the engine works. And the more I pay attention to budgeting, the more I realize how next to impossible it is to fund our mammoth federal government. It relies on good behavior. It relies on patriotism. It relies on norms, people who want the system to work. It relies on members of the House. It relies on members of the Senate who take government seriously, who are willing to compromise. And when you pay attention to the budget and when you realize how easy it is to screw up this process, you see how vulnerable the process is because democracy is vulnerable. It always is. Democracy, a republic, is vulnerable. And all it takes is a wrecking ball like Donald Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates, or Chip Roy or the entire Freedom Caucus to grind the entire process to a halt and destroy millions of lives overnight. You know, the insurrection that took place, the idea that Mike Pence didn't have to certify the election for Joe Biden, it was a an illegal criminal misreading of the Constitution, but it was also the norm. It's vice presidents honoring norms and decency. And when that disappears, it's a Hobbesian nightmare. Now, look, I think people who listen to this show know that I'm not an institutionalist. I'm not a defender of the system or the status quo. But I also know how hard it is to keep things going, how hard it is to get people on the same team. And I also know how easy it is to just break something. It's really easy to go into your kitchen and break plates and break cabinets and glass. Much harder to remodel a kitchen, much harder. Being a wrecking ball is simple. That's why simpletons are wrecking balls. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a wrecking ball because she's a simpleton. Donald Trump is a wrecking ball because he's a simpleton. George W. Bush was a wrecking ball and he's a simpleton. He went in and wrecked Iraq and Afghanistan and had no idea how to rebuild it. House Judiciary Committee and Wrecking Ball, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan has subpoenaed the Bank of America to turn over documents they handed to the FBI in order to prosecute hundreds of Trump supporters who wrecked the Capitol on January 6. The Bank of America said it didn't violate any consumer privacy laws when it complied with the FBI's request. This is what Jim Jordan is looking into. Earlier this year, Jordan subpoenaed Citibank to turn over records that reveal how much the FBI relied on credit card statements to prove that purchases made by the January 6th defendants in the lead up to the insurrection helped prove their guilt. You know, while Jim Jordan is so busy with subpoenas uh, and January 6th, subpoenas about January 6th, uh, why not honor the subpoena 
that the January 6th committee sent you to tell us what exactly you talked to Donald Trump about during all those phone calls you shared on January 6th. How many times did you talk to Donald Trump before, during, and after the insurrection, Jim Jordan? How many meetings did you have with President Trump before January 6th? But he's looking into the prosecution of close to a thousand of the insurrectionists. He's more concerned about whether or not their privacy was violated. Jordan is also planning to look into who planted two pipe bombs on January 6th that didn't go off near the Capitol. For God's sakes, does everything have to involve Marjorie Taylor Greene? Look, I, I don't think she planted those pipe bombs, but she is a moron, and those two pipe bombs didn't go off. And the fact that they didn't go off suggests to me that she planted them. Not a bright woman. Meanwhile, no, I don't want a software update. My, okay. Meanwhile, the Senate, sorry, I got a, somebody flash me. Would you like a software update? No, I don't. Meanwhile, the Senate Judiciary Committee is chaired by Democrat Dick Durbin. And once again, he was forced to delay issuing subpoenas, ordering billionaire Harlan Crow and judicial activist Leonard Leo to testify and tell the Senate committee about the hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts they've lavished Judge Clarence Thomas with over the decades. He keeps trying to subpoena. You know, the Democrats control the Senate. And Dick Durbin, that makes Dick Durbin the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, he's a Democrat. Twice he's tried to vote on subpoenas to get Harlan Crow, who I think has one of the largest collections of Nazi paraphernalia in the world, I think, and Leonard Leo uh, to testify, and he can't get these subpoenas passed because Ted Cruz and Tom Cotton are tying it up. Well, New Hampshire... As a secretary of state, his name is David Scanlon. He's a Republican. On, and on Thursday, he said that it's official. The New Hampshire primary is now set for January 23rd. So it's a little, little more than two months away. Joe Biden will not be participating in the New Hampshire primary because he's trying to make South Carolina the first primary for Democratic contenders. This is his attempt to give the South, and especially black voters, more of a say in future elections and in in how we pick our candidates. His idea is that South Carolina should vet the candidates early on instead of the heavily white states of Iowa and New Hampshire. Democrats are also upset with Iowa for the way they handled the caucuses back in 2020. Uh, The Democratic Party feels uh, local Democrats in Iowa bungled the process, and therefore they've lost the right to be first in the nation. But Republicans are keeping with the traditional schedule. Iowa's Republican Caucasians will hold their caucuses it should be called the Iowa Caucasians, on January 15th. And that, yeah, is two months away. This is exciting. I get excited uh, the same way I get excited on a roller coaster that uh, (laughs) isn't safe. Nothing more exciting than getting on a roller coaster at a state fair. This is what it feels like, the 2024 elections. Well, Ron DeSantis' signature piece of legislation, his anti-drag law that helped catapult him to national prominence, was blocked by our nation's Supreme Court on Thursday. The law that DeSantis signed made it a crime to facilitate a child witnessing a performance that could be considered sexually explicit. 
drag shows, for example. The court said this raised several First Amendment considerations and is a drag queen sexual. I mean, just because it turns Ron DeSantis on, just because saying RuPaul gives Ron DeSantis a stiffy doesn't make drag queens, drag shows sexual. Semaphore reports that this is just another in an increasingly long line of DeSantis's anti-woke measures that are being blocked by the courts. Semaphore says the courts blocked one of the Florida governor's laws that try to limit racial bias training in corporate settings, because that's a big problem. The, the racial bias trainings that are going on in corporate. This is like you, you're the governor of Florida. You can feed the poor, house the homeless, educate our students clean up crime and your biggest concern is limiting racial bias training in corporate settings. Go F yourself, really. USA Today back in June reported on the DeSantis laws that have been blocked by lower courts. For example, Ron DeSantis passed a law in Florida that forbids anyone from China owning Florida property. And that was overturned by the courts. The lower courts blocked one of DeSantis's new laws that said only United States citizens could work for organizations that register people to vote. Yeah, that would be illegal, telling uh, a get-out-the-vote organization that they can only hire American citizens. In June, a U.S. court blocked a new Ron DeSantis law that prevents Medicaid from providing the Medicare, medical care necessary for transgender patients like puberty blockers, hormone therapy, and surgery. That's what he does. You go after the most vulnerable people in our society. Who is more vulnerable than people who are transitioning? and you try to drive them to suicide. There's a special place in hell for people like Ron DeSantis. It's called Florida. In 2022, a court blocked DeSantis's 15-week ban on abortions. Last year, a judge blocked parts of Ron DeSantis's, Ron DeSantis's Stop Woke Act, which limited how race and gender could be discussed in college classrooms. What I thought he was all about the First Amendment. Wasn't he all about, like, getting rid of the PC culture and letting people say whatever's on their mind? Last year, the courts blocked a redistricting map drawn by DeSantis loyalists in Florida who gerrymandered away two black congressional districts. Two years ago, a judge blocked DeSantis's so-called anti-riot bill, which limits protesting by increasing penalties for misdemeanors, turning them into felonies. And uh, the law also made it easier for the cops to charge protesters with inciting a riot. That was another law that the courts reversed. Now, Ron DeSantis on the campaign trail says since he became governor, Florida is where woke goes to die, sounds like Florida's where laws against wokeism go to die. He's a failure. He can't even win on the culture issues. He's a failure. I've gone over the numbers. One of the highest crime rates in America, Florida. A fash I mean, the one saving grace of a fascist is if you're a white heterosexual male, it should be safe for you to walk the streets. And Florida is one of the unsafest places in America for white heterosexual males. So what's the point of being a fascist if it's dangerous for white heterosexual males? Well, fascists are stupid. He's stupid. Speaking of incredibly stupid, knuckle-dragging, mouth-breathing Neanderthals, Nikki Haley 
On yesterday's show, we went over a New Hampshire poll showing Nikki Haley vaulting past Ron DeSantis. She is now coming in second in New Hampshire. This is huge. You cannot overstate the importance of this. A new CNN poll of New Hampshire voters was released late Thursday night, and it's even better news for Haley. And this should be keeping Donald Trump up at night, but he doesn't sleep, so everything keeps him up at night. The poll shows Haley coming in second with 20% of the vote and Trump getting 42%. So Trump is coming down and she is going up. And as I've been saying for the past three months, Trump's poll numbers have only one way to go before New Hampshire, and that's down. He has a base and a ceiling, and that ceiling is going to keep coming down, 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 and become his base. And he can't win with just his base. I know hope springs eternal with never-Trumpers. Well, I'm not a never-Trumper. I'm a Democrat. But the never-Trumpers are getting excited because there are little more than two months before the New Hampshire primary and the Iowa caucuses. So it's not too difficult to imagine that Nikki Haley, with momentum, with other candidates dropping out, and more and more Trump missteps, you know, he's misfiring in his speeches. It's not hard to imagine Haley picking up steam and surpassing Trump in the New Hampshire primaries. Keep in mind, Nikki Haley doesn't need to win in New Hampshire. A strong second place showing is enough for the narrative to coalesce where Nikki Haley's the only one strong enough to challenge Donald Trump. You don't, she doesn't need to win the New Hampshire primary. She just needs to come in a strong second. A lot of people think in 1968, Lyndon Baines Johnson dropped out because he lost the New Hampshire primary to Eugene McCarthy. But he didn't lose to Eugene McCarthy. McCarthy just did incredibly well, and it signaled to Lyndon Johnson, this is not, my, my days are numbered. So even though Lyndon Johnson won the New Hampshire primary, he didn't win it by enough, so he dropped out. So Nikki Haley, she doesn't need to win New Hampshire or Iowa. She just needs to do really well. She's the one. She's the one. When you look at the 2016 Republican race, Trump was up against Eventually, I mean, look, at I'm showing a picture. There were, there were like 10 guys on the stage at that time. Uh, but he was up against five incredibly strong establishment candidates when he got to New Hampshire for the primary. You had Ted Cruz, Chris Christie, Marco Rubio, John Kasich, the Ohio governor, and of course, the front runner, Jeb Bush. It was a much stronger field in 2016. Trump was up against a much stronger field in 2016 than what Trump is up against right now. So these guys split the never Trump vote back in 2016. Trump got 35 percent of the vote in the 2016 New Hampshire primary. Kasich, the Ohio governor, got 16 percent Cruz got close to 12%. Jeb Bush only got 11%. Well, right there, you add that together, you got 39% versus Trump's 35%. You throw in Marco Rubio and Chris Christie, that's 17%. That gives you 56% of New Hampshire Republicans in 2016 not voting for Donald Trump. Okay, so what we're seeing in the lead up to Iowa and especially New Hampshire in 2024, like I just said, is Donald Trump going up against a much 
weaker field than he did in 2016. And that could prove more of a challenge to Trump because it is now much easier for one challenger to emerge. And it's Nikki Haley. It's Nikki Haley. There's DeSantis and Chris Christie and Nikki Haley. That's it. And Iowa is, we're talking two months. I mean, they really have filtered out the candidates, much more so than in 2016. And that's bad for Trump because of Haley, DeSantis, and Christie, one of them will emerge and more than half of the Republican Party theoretically will coalesce around them. Ramaswamy is nothing. He's a zero. So more and more Republicans are starting to see a clear pathway for Nikki Haley, especially if Ron DeSantis drops out before New Hampshire. The problem is Ron DeSantis just got the endorsement from the governor of Iowa. So he has to stay in the race until Iowa. But if he doesn't do well in Iowa, then it's down to Haley, Christie, and Trump going into New Hampshire. If Haley looks like she's going to be beating Trump in the next four weeks, Christie's donations start drying up. And so does Ron DeSantis's donations. And so you got Chris Christie dropping out and he's going to campaign for Nikki Haley. And if Ron DeSantis is out of the picture, I mean, he's got to stay through Iowa. Uh, we're looking at a very interesting race. Really interesting. Trump versus Nikki Haley. This is... If it's down to Haley and Trump, uh, Trump, what does he do? Does he fight dirty? How does he do this? Uh, yeah, that's all he knows how to do. But will that work against a woman? And Nikki Haley, I was reading about her uh, over at Semaphore, uh, uh, Dave Weigel, I think it's Dave Weigel at, at Semaphore. I apologize if, I, if I'm getting the author wrong. But he was talking about how she won the governorship in 2010 in South Carolina, and it was dirty. I had no idea what they, what they did to her. They accused her of cheating on her husband. Men stepped forward saying that they that they had affairs with her. It was grotesque. And she rose above it all. And it just empowered her. Uh, so it, it she, Trump may not be equipped to deal with somebody like Nikki Haley, a Republican. It's hard to demonize a Republican woman in the Republican Party. Hillary is a different story. If it's down to Haley and Trump, with Trump going through four criminal trials before the convention, that's what it's looking like. Four criminal trials in the lead up to the convention, plus the rape trial, that's the day of the Iowa caucuses. Trump knows that unless he wins the presidency, he's going to prison. That does things to a man, changes your mind, changes the chemistry in your brain. Trump is now fighting for his life. And this could end up being the ugliest and dirtiest race for any party's presidential nomination we have ever seen in American history. We saw two days ago what these Republicans are like in the House during these hearings. We see the infighting that goes on. This could be very, very ugly, and not in a good way, right? I'd like to see Republicans beating up on each other, 
But this could get really ugly because Donald Trump will not accept defeat, especially from another Republican, especially from Nikki Haley, a former member of his cabinet. There is no reason to think that if Trump loses, say, South Carolina or Florida to Haley, he, he will unleash an army of lawyers. He'll unleash a Brooks Brothers riot to physically threaten Haley campaign officials. I mean, he did lose in 2016. He lost the Iowa caucuses to Ted Cruz. The first thing he said was fraud at the polls. He, he said Ted Cruz stole that election. And then Trump started winning, and so he didn't have to play the election interference card. But if he, if he starts losing some primaries and he's fighting for his life now, uh, you know, the thing about Trump is he doesn't limit his vitriol, his threats, his physical intimidation just to Democrats. In fact, if you're a Republican, you're more likely to be on the receiving end of Trump's verbal and physical abuse than you are if you're a Democrat. More Republicans have been physically and emotionally abused by Donald Trump than Democrats. Ask Rusty Bowers, the former Republican Speaker of the Arizona State House, or Brad Raffensperger, the Republican Secretary of State in Georgia, or of course, Mike Pence. Remember Mike Pence? Seriously, ask Mike Pence how dangerous it was for him, not just on January 6th, but out on the campaign trail, how MAGA Republicans showed up and intimidated him. So Wall Street money is rushing right now to Nikki Haley. It's rushing away from Ron DeSantis not going to Chris Christie. There's nobody else left. So all the Wall Street money, the, she's the, the last hope for never Trumpers. Tim Scott's donors, such as they were, have reportedly moved over to Nikki Haley and are flooding her with campaign cash. We are getting reports of a small private breakfast that Nikki Haley flew into New York for. She's the former United Nations ambassador under Trump, and she's well-respected among the financiers on Wall Street. She held meetings earlier this week, top-secret meetings, with former Trump economic advisor Gary Cohen, who hates Trump, the head of BlackRock, who hates Trump, one of Mitt Romney, Romney's associates from Bain Capital. They all reportedly met secretly with Nikki Haley and uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, helped orchestrate all these meet and greets. And they seem to be willing to throw money at her a lot. She's already spent $10 million dollars in just for December alone, for ad buys in New Hampshire and uh, Iowa. Dan Balls, writing in the Washington Post, says if Haley can come in second and the rest of the field drops out, leaving it a contest simply between Haley and Trump, she is a problem for Donald Trump. Now, on yesterday's program, I talked about this. I said the other candidates would have to coalesce. I was wrong. I, I, I read Dan Balls today, and, uh, and I realized I was wrong yesterday when I said it, it's necessary for the other candidates to coalesce and throw their support behind her. That's, they don't need to, she doesn't need that. Uh, if she comes in second in New Hampshire, that creates its own momentum. And while it's helpful to have your opponents drop out and endorse you, the media, coupled with the tangible excitement of a real showdown between Haley and Trump, 
That changes the dynamics of the race overnight, with or without Ron DeSantis and Chris Christie endorsing her. In the Trump era, never, under, never underestimate the importance of spectacle. Republican voters aren't there for policy. They're there for the sizzle, for the show. Uh, they pretend to talk about policy, but it doesn't hold up under scrutiny. It's an appeal to your emotions, especially your anger. That's what their policy is. This is going to be a spectacle. Weak on substance, but flashy, interesting, and highly personal. And there is one policy that Republicans are trying to wrestle out from under, and that is abortion. That is a real policy that they have to deal with. And they are being dragged down by abortion. And Nikki Haley, of all the candidates running for the Republican nomination, has the most perfect stance on abortion. What is her stance on abortion? And it's better than everybody else's. Her stance is she's a woman. That's her stance. And with Republican voters, that's all you need. She's a woman. And she sidesteps the entire issue. She says, you know, we don't need to demonize the other side. We need, you know, she's for abortion. She's against abortion. But let's not demonize the, the pro-choicers. It's bullshit, but it plays well with ignoramuses. At the same time, this is the issue. Abortion, especially in the lead up to the convention. In the lead up to the convention, how Haley and how Trump discuss abortion will determine who gets the nomination. And Trump is making mistakes on abortion. When you get the nomination and you're running against Biden, then you can ease uh, off on the accelerator. But if you want to get the Republican nomination, the infrastructure, the get out the vote infrastructure in the Republican Party is predicated on the pro-life movement helping you, the churches getting out that vote. You have to go all in on being against abortion if you want to get the nomination. After you get the nomination, you can move to the center. But Trump uh, is pushing the evangelicals away. He has told the evangelicals that they're ungrateful and that they have to cave, they have to compromise on abortion. He said that uh, I gave you three justices who overturned Roe v. Wade, and that's not good enough for you? That's what he said to the evangelicals. He said uh, that he's for abortion, uh, you know, th that he's willing to accept uh, exceptions for abortion, that you, you just can't be against it uh, with no exemptions. As I said, in terms of winning, you don't say that to the evangelicals because you need the evangelicals to get the vote out on primary day. The churches, that's what moves the needle in the Republican primaries, the evangelical get out the vote machine. So Trump is beginning to blow it with evangelicals. And if it's down to Trump and Haley, the two of them are going to out anti-abortion each other. They have to, assuming Trump is, is, assuming his brain is remotely functioning. Uh, and no matter what Trump says on abortion, if you watch Nikki Haley, 
during the debates. She's honed her abortion message. Uh, No matter what Trump says on abortion, it will never sound as pro-life or as moderate as Haley saying those same exact same words. You know, uh, this may be the end of democracy. I have a feeling, though, it's going to be we're going out with a bang. I think this is going to be an interesting race for the Republican nomination with all these criminal indictments. Uh, Well, in the Donald Trump civil fraud trial, an appeals judge has temporarily lifted the gag order on Trump and his lawyers. That was the gag order imposed by the presiding judge, Arthur Engeron, who has already used the gag order twice to fine Donald Trump a total of $15,000 for attacking the judge's clerk. How are we doing on time here? All right. Uh, let's see. I've got some notes. Yeah, I'll keep going. Okay. After Romney lost in 2012, Republicans conducted an autopsy. They called it an autopsy. Why did we do so badly? They concluded it was Rince Priebus who ended up becoming Donald Trump's chief of staff. He was head of the Republican Party at the time. And they conducted what they called an autopsy to figure out why they lost to Obama in 2012. And they concluded they had to do a better job at reaching out to the Latino voter. Four years later, they nominated Donald Trump, whose opening salvo was calling Mexicans rapists. That was in 2015 when Trump declared. And everyone said, well, so much for reaching out to Latino voters. But it turns out Trump... And the Republicans have done a surprisingly good job winning over the Latino vote. Donald Trump got nearly 40 percent of the Latino vote in the 2020 presidential election. Now, that's incredible considering the racism he spewed against migrants, as well as people of color and Mexicans. So why is Trump doing better with Latinos? It has something to do with George W. Bush invading Iraq and not knowing the, the Sunnis and Shiites live there, and uh, they're not the same people. When they told him about Sunni and Shiites, he said, well, they're Arabs, right? They're Muslims. Well, no, but this was after he invaded Uh, Iraq. He found out that Sunni and Shiites don't get along. And Democrats just assumed the Latino vote was this monolithic block, that people from Venezuela are no different from people from Central America or Mexico. They're all the same, right? The Republicans figured out something that the Democrats didn't. Now, the Democrats still win the Latino vote, but it's pretty incredible that Donald Trump got 40 percent of the Latino vote. In 2020, that's amazing, considering who he is, what he says and what he stands for. So how did that happen? Well, he lives in Florida And he learned that Latinos are not a monolithic voting bloc, especially in Miami, where Cubans can often end up being the most conservative demographic. According to Axios, one of the contributing factors to Florida going from a swing state to a solid red is the Republican Party's outreach to conservative Latinos in Florida, Cubans. They are refugees from the Castro regime, so they believe they they know the evils of socialism firsthand and more and more are gravitating to Republicans who present as the party of capitalism. And Republicans thought, well, 
if that's going on in Florida with Cubans, what about other Latino people? Trump and the Republicans have come to learn that in the vast expanse of Latino voters, it's not just the Cuban vote that's up for grabs. This is why Trump calls all Democrats, including and especially Joe Biden, a socialist. Every time I hear Trump calling Biden a Marxist and a socialist, I go, if only, right? So why is he doing that? That's his way of appealing to the Latino voters from Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cubans, other Latinos who are first, second generation refugees from what they believe are socialist regimes. The Latino voter goes to church. And while abortion is dragging Republicans down with suburban white moms, at the same time, abortion, their position on abortion is lifting Republicans up inside the religious right-wing Latino community. Everything I thought I knew, I didn't know. This is a little surprising to me. I understood why the Cuban voters in Florida were susceptible to the charms of right-wing uh, politicians. I didn't think it could be uh, expanded upon. Well, a new Quinnipiac poll out uh, just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I've been wrestling with this, and I know a lot of my listeners don't like me going over polls, but as I've said, polls, you don't use them to predict the future because candidates read the polls and they adjust accordingly. So a poll is a snapshot, but the results a year from now are going to be different because politicians read these polls and they change the way they speak because of it. So it's important to look at polls. Sorry. Okay. I'm thirsty today. So <clears throat> I'm not... Uh, so I'm going to go over these polls, not to give you an idea of who's going to win, but to give you an idea of how the parties are going to tack with the wins. So this doesn't make sense to me. It's bad for Biden. And uh, it worries me because I assume the American people see what I see. It turns out it's the other way around. I live in Manhattan I don't see what the American people see. I see what they should see. I live in a city where most people just go to work and shuffle, shuffle paper all day. And on paper, Biden has a stunning record to run on as long as you're one of the 40% of Americans who is eligible to vote and votes on paper. If you crunch the numbers, Biden is doing great among, you would think, the 40% of Americans who are eligible to vote and vote. And I could go on and on about this, uh, but if, if you don't vote, there are many reasons people don't vote. You fall through the cracks. In this country, if you fall through the cracks and you don't vote, uh, politically you don't exist. So I'll, that's a whole other conversation. So I'll start briefly with the Trump-Biden matchup, according to the Quinnipiac poll. Trump gets 48 percent. A year from now, Biden gets 46. So that doesn't mean anything. That's it's a it's a dead heat. 
doesn't mean anything. However, this is when, when you go into what they call the internals, when you dig down, it seems a little more frightening. Joe Biden is underwater. Uh, his approval ratings are underwater. So uh, at the top, this is the overall approval rating, 37% of the American people approve of the job he's doing. This is the Quinnipiac poll. Uh, that's really bad, 37%. You know, you got to, they, they say an incumbent needs to be at 50, 51% to get reelected. That's what they say, but I, I'm going to tell you why I think it's no longer applicable. So he's at 37%. The same poll gives Donald Trump a 42% 42, 42 favorability rating. So Trump's favorability rating, you know, 5% higher. It's a little better than Joe Biden's, but like Joe Biden, he too is underwater and drowning. And he was underwater in 2020 and drowning. So these numbers tell a story. And I, I think it's a story that, that will emerge. I don't think we're seeing it. Uh, what, what is happening is Americans are disgusted with politics overall. There is a general disgust now for Washington, D.C. So the entire political system is underwater. We've lost faith in all our institutions. Americans don't approve of anything. According to the Real Clear averages, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has a 22% approval rating. He's, uh, what is that? He's more than 36% underwater. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has a 31% approval rating. So he's doing a lot better than McConnell. But when you take into account that if your approval rating drops below 50%, you're drowning. Nobody, not Mike Johnson, the new speaker, not Vice President Harris, Nikki Haley, nobody's approval rating comes close to 50%. So what does that mean? It means Americans are going to vote. They have to vote for somebody. They're going to vote for a candidate even though they don't like or approve of them. I mean, you, you saw that with me. In 2020, I, I didn't like Joe Biden. I didn't approve of Joe Biden. Uh, I voted for him. And I know people who didn't approve of Donald Trump. They didn't like Donald Trump, but they voted for him. The days of hero worship are over. The days of looking up to politicians as gods are over. And maybe that's healthier. So these approval ratings, which we used to rely on as leading indicators, may not be as accurate uh, as they once used to be. Why do you vote for a candidate? Why, why would you vote for a congressperson or a senator or a president? Security. Financial security and physical security. You may not know that, but most studies show that deep down inside, when you, when you go to vote, you're looking for somebody who will make you feel physically and financially secure. It doesn't matter what the truth is. You know, uh, people uh, who are not financially or physically secure vote for Donald Trump, who makes them less physically and financially secure, but they, he makes them feel like he's provided them with physical and financial security. This is the problem with a democracy or a republic when you dumb down the schools and the voters and you can't 
run on policy when you have to, as Adley Stevenson said, sell politicians like soap. That's what we're doing. Adley Stevenson warned in the 50s, if candidates start running ads, they'll just appeal to emotions and sell us like soap. I wish <laughs> it was sold like soap because there's there's truth in advertising. When you when you sell soap, you have to tell the truth. Not if you're a politician. You can legally you're allowed to just say whatever you want in a TV ad. So it's financial security, physical security, and what I call strange. Americans love strange. Uh, political scientists call it uh, something new and exciting. I call it strange. And Donald Trump, to his credit, he has got that locked. Nobody can compete with Donald Trump when it comes to strange and exciting. You just don't know what's going to happen. And if you are... You know, if you're not worried about being evicted, where your next meal is coming from, you just want to turn on the TV at 8 o'clock and watch the show, you vote for Donald Trump. Uh, now, just to put the Quinnipiac poll into perspective and Trump into perspective and remind you this is just a snapshot, if you look at the averages... If you look at the real clear averages of all the approval ratings, Joe Biden's approval rating is actually higher than Donald Trump's. OK, I'm just looking at the Quinnipiac poll. But if you average out all the polls that test the candidates approval ratings, Joe Biden has a, an approval rating that's one percent higher than Donald Trump's. So that's important to point out. And the reason I'm telling you this is it's going to be an incredibly tight race in next November because they study voters on a granular level and they figure out how to parse the demographics and peel away voters in counties and cities and states and they know how to tighten it up by delivering certain messages in certain uh, markets. And uh, this is what happens when you have low information voters. They're susceptible to Facebook ads, right? So they find, let me find uh, 100,000 uh, Roman Catholic men whose wives left them who are raising uh, a, a teenage daughters. And then you just start messaging to them. You know, the Cambridge Analytica stuff that actually didn't work, but uh, this is how they tighten these races. So again, this is, let's go back to the Quinnipiac poll. This is just interesting. Uh, it's not accurate. None of this stuff is accurate. But candidates will tack with the wind here. 47% of Americans approve of Joe Biden's handling of the war in Ukraine. I find that surprising. I, I thought it would be lower. 37% uh, of Americans approve of the way he's handling the war between Israel and Hamas. That I, I found also surprising. 34% uh, approve of his foreign policy in general. Usually presidents do well with the American people when it comes to foreign policy. So that's bad for Biden, for Americans not to approve of his foreign policy. Foreign policy is a layup for a president. You should be above 50% on foreign policy, unless he got us into a, a war, which he hasn't, sort of. Uh, gets worse. 
37% approve of the way he's handling the economy. Now, there is a type of person like me who was raised to believe that the economy, when it comes to presidential politics, is the big enchilada. There's a, there's a certain generation of Democrats who were taught you win, people vote with their wallet, that the economy is the big enchilada. You know, foreign policy, assuming you don't get yourself into a war, doesn't weigh as heavily on the outcome of an election as the economy. So, working off the numbers, and again, this is for the 40% of Americans who vote, uh, not the people who have fallen through the cracks and are living uh, in their car if they're lucky enough to have one. I'm talking about people, I mean, you can't vote if you don't, if you don't have a, an address to register. So this is playing to people who haven't fallen through the cracks yet. Joe Biden seems to have a messaging problem when it comes to the economy. That's what we're being told, that Americans don't see how good things are with the economy. You're so busy worrying that you can't make rent or pay the rest of your bills. Can't you see? Look, look up from your calculator Stop thinking about your own financial morass and look at these numbers. Bidenomics is working. Uh, that's what they're thinking in the Biden White House. If only Americans would stop worrying about not being able to pay for gas and food, they'd, <laughs> they'd realize, I, I apologize for laughing, but that is how out of touch uh, they are in the White House. Uh, but I do believe that Biden, like Obama, is doing uh, what he can. He's, he was never going to be a trans transformational president. And uh, sometimes the Republicans and people like Joe Manchin just wear me down. And I think... This Biden is the best. Obama is the best we can do. They, they, you get worn down uh, deep into a, a presidency and you see what they're up against and you start making excuses for them. Which brings us to the border crisis. And this is why I'm very nervous about next November. 26% of Americans approve of Joe Biden's handling of the border. This is a big problem for Joe Biden. This is one of those things that I've ignored uh, in terms of it being a political football. And uh, the border is, I am now beginning to see how the Republicans are gonna use the, this manufactured, cruel, border issue to their advantage. And I have no idea what you do if you're Joe Biden. Uh, Biden and the Democrats will win if it's abortion on the ballot. But if the border is on the ballot, they lose big. I mean, look at that. 26% of Americans approve of Biden's handling of the border. That's his lowest approval rating. Of all the issues, it's the border. And uh, it's a bigger problem for Democrats now than it was four years ago, especially since blue state mayors and governors are playing right into Texas Governor Greg Abbott's hands they are suddenly, the blue state mayors and governors are suddenly acknowledging the migrant crisis after he, Greg Abbott, began putting migrants on buses and shipping them into 
blue, blue cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Boston, Philadelphia. This works for Republicans. It's cruel. It is to take the most vulnerable humans and put them on buses. I don't even want to talk about the cruelty. I'm talking about the politics of it right now. To suddenly hear the mayor of New York, this is what the mayor of New York said this year. He said the migrant crisis is going to destroy his city and he doesn't know what to do about it. Well, that is political manna from heaven for the GOP. Because up until this year, big city, big city blue, blue state mayors demeaned Texas. They said, hey, we'll be sanctuary cities. We won't cooperate with ICE. Los Angeles doesn't cooperate with ICE. Uh, Bill de Blasio, when he was mayor, wouldn't cooperate with ICE. Uh, that's beginning to change uh, because of perception as opposed to reality, because never forget the border crisis is mostly perception. Republicans now get to say, oh, suddenly you see what we've been going through. The Republicans know a good issue when they have one. And the migrant crisis, they're going to try to make it. Uh, they're going to try to make 2024 about the migrant crisis. Something I wouldn't dignify. And you do that at your own peril. They want to run on border security. Border security preys on... Uh, the two most important factors uh, right of center voters take into consideration when they're filling out their ballot. Who makes me feel secure? Who makes me feel secure physically and financially? And if you saw Marjorie Taylor Greene going after Alejandro Mayorkas, the head of Homeland Security, Two days ago, when he was testifying before the Homeland Security Committee, she was showing pictures of couples from Georgia who were killed by migrants, children who were who died from overdoses from drugs brought in by migrants. And that's a lie. Migrants don't bring in fentanyl. We went over that yesterday. Doesn't matter. This is politics. Migrants are taking, and financially, you can, they lie and say migrants are either stealing jobs or draining our coffers because they're expensive to take care of. All lies. All lies. Uh, and uh, somebody who calls themselves a Christian nationalist like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Anything but this is the most anti-Christian thing you can say, that America can't afford to take care of the migrants, when in fact you study Economics 101 and learn about the multiplier effect. You welcome a migrant into America and you give them a dollar. Uh, that dollar gets passed along and that one dollar in a week changes hands a hundred times. And the city, the state, skims off the top with taxes. It's how you grow an economy, you effing morons. You effing racist morons. That's, that's how this country got built. Bringing people in, throwing them some some cash, and they spread it around. Money has to keep moving. When money moves, the economy grows. The fastest way to accelerate money is to bring migrants in, give them a little, here, here's some money, spread it around. Uh, so... People like me who've been trivializing the border issue, we do it at our own peril. It's 
It is a manufactured crisis, uh, but it works. Uh, because you, especially with Republicans, because you can't win the border crisis politically using logic. Uh, so what is the 2024 presidential election going to be about? Well, if it were up to me and most Democrats, it would be the economy. And Biden can win that argument. If it's about abortion or the culture issues, Biden and the Democrats can win on that, too. There's a reason the Republicans will not let go of the border, quote unquote, crisis. They understand that it taps into the right wing primitive brain. It is a powerful political cult cudgel. It taps into defining who we are as a people, uh, what language we speak, what color we are. It taps into the lizard brain's need for security. It taps into the idea that foreigners are invading our country. It taps into the distrust of Washington. Washington can't stop these migrants from sneaking in. It taps into national security fears. Vladimir Putin is an abstraction to Republicans. But migrants right at the door, well, that's a tangible threat that they can believe. The border crisis taps into economic precarity, scapegoats, finds a, a, a scapegoat for economic precarity. It's perfect for Republicans. You don't have to blame the rich. Uh, you don't have to blame corporate greed. It's the migrants. And when it comes to Republicans, it taps into their need to be sadistic, to, to find an enemy who you can hate and dehumanize. And it's much more satisfying to dehumanize people who you can actually imagine in your neighborhood, who you can see, who you think might be migrants. It taps into the America First isolationist impulses that way too many Americans possess. You know, I just want to be left alone. Why do they keep coming here? Why do we keep getting dragged into wars? Just leave us alone. Don't come here and don't make us go anywhere. So Nikki Haley has come up with a nimble sidestep when it comes to abortion. I don't think Biden has a nimble sidestep when it comes to the border, quote unquote, crisis. Because there are 1,000 working parts to the so-called border crisis. And in today's political landscape, trying to explain the 1,000 working parts of a, a border crisis, uh, voters their eyes glaze over. The Republicans have an issue here. They love this because they can reduce it to good versus evil, brown versus white. The border as a political football is perfect for the Republicans. There's no right way for Biden to message on this and expect to win the election. He cannot win. Democrats cannot win if this election turns into a referendum on the border. So although I have seen Gavin Newsom do a pretty good job, Gavin Newsom is getting better and better. Uh, but we're talking about Joe Biden and the sclerotic Democrats in Washington, D.C. And I don't think if this somehow becomes the issue uh, 
And, you know, it's just, can the Republicans force the border crisis uh, down our eyeballs? Listeners to the show know I believe the border crisis is fake. We should let these people in because we need them. You have a new Speaker of the House who calls himself a devout Christian who complains that Roe, that legalized abortion, is responsible for the shortage of able-bodied workers in America. He says we've been, he said, abortion has killed off all the able-bodied workers in America who we need to keep our economy afloat. The people who pay into Medicare and Social Security for future generations. Meanwhile, down at the border are the citizens, the future citizens we so desperately need. Our population, the numbers, we're declining. And without new people coming in, we will turn into an older country with no young workers to prop up our system, our economic system, and our social safety net. The migrants are a gift from God. We have a problem. Our population is declining and we were sent a gift. And schmucks that we are, we don't see them as a gift. These beautiful, beautiful, precious people who love this country so much that they would risk life and limb, literally life and limb. The, the border wall is killing them and cutting their limbs off. They still want to get to this country. They're the most patriotic among us. And we put them in detention centers. We force sterilize them. Uh, we need them. Look at what's happening in Japan. Japan has had a 30-year recession because they have an aging, declining population. If we don't get more people in here, this country will die if climate change doesn't get to us first. The problem with the messaging, what I just said, which is correct and righteous and true, love and reason don't win elections here in America. Hatred and scapegoating, that's how you win. Love and reason, it's hard to run on love and reason. The 2024 election isn't just about the future of our democracy. It's about fascism taking root. And that's true. Fascism is taking root. And we see the playbook that Trump is working off of. Uh, you've, right? Everybody's been talking about his use of the word vermin when he talks about migrants poisoning America's blood. We know whose language he's pinching. He's pinching Hitler because Donald Trump is not that bright. So he went to the source. He can't even, he just plagiarizes. He can't even rewrite Mein Kampf. He just pinches it. So the Republicans, I believe, are right when they say the border issue, ask the question, what kind of country do we want to be? What kind of country do you want to be? For Republicans, it's do we want America to be a nation of white Christians? Or do you want it to be a nation of brown people? It's this mannequin, it's either or. We're either going to be a nation of white Christians or brown, anti-Western whatevers. For Democrats, the border situation also forces us to ask, what kind of country, what kind of people do we want to be? Do we want to be a pluralistic nation, a pluralistic people grounded in the Enlightenment? 
or do we want fascism? Because this is the border crisis. You cannot separate fascism from this manufactured border crisis. This is exactly what Hitler did. It's always about rescuing German nationals in the Sudetenland, always rescuing the German-speaking people in Austria on the border with France. We're doing this to save the German-speaking people and preserving our blood, keeping the vermin out. So the border crisis is very much linked to the future of our democracy and fascism. Can't separate it. I don't know how the Democrats, for the life of me, I don't know how you sell Americans on compassion, growth, when it comes to the border crisis. As I said, there are a thousand working pieces here for people to understand that it's not a crisis and what we need to do. I don't know how you message that to the American people. I don't know how you sell Americans on compassion, growth, economic growth, because these human beings bring with them economic growth, you effing morons not to know that. It's economics 101. Every one of those kids, those parents, add to our GDP. But that's how powerful racism and stupidity are that you would sacrifice economic growth to keep brown people out. I don't know how you message this. I don't know how you message why we need a social safety net, how that keeps you physically and financially secure. Uh, I don't know how you message the importance of taking care of people in need. Uh, and I don't know how you message love. I don't know how you do it, especially when you have the most hateful people in this country taking the moral high ground and claiming they're disciples of Christ. I don't know. I don't know how you beat them at this. I do think, I do think, even though he was not my first choice or my second choice, or my third choice, Joe Biden was not on the top of my list. Uh, he still isn't. But he's what we got. I think the choice between Biden and Trump is a choice between love and hate. I do. And I worry that in America, hate always seems to win. So what's it going to be? Uh, not Nikki Haley. Not Nikki Haley. I'd rather see Trump back in the White House than Nikki Haley. Because at least Donald Trump is a failure and he's self-destructive and he turns on everybody. I'd rather have it be Donald Trump than Nikki Haley, a Reagan-esque puppet. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to my nonsense. Please share this with your friends, please, through social media. Uh, the show is sustained by the listeners. Um, kind of amazed, uh, there, you know, no corporate underwriting, no, no advertising. I'm not part of any of these podcasting cooperatives, uh, except for Sam Cedar and Robert Smigel. Uh, uh, it's the listeners who are uh, helping this show. So thank you. Uh, it, it it really is amazing to me. And how gr I'm just really grateful that people uh, share the show. So thank you. Leave comments. Uh, one, one comment got to me. I got angry. 
at one of the, this is good. I read your comments. One of, one of you got to me, and I responded to it yesterday. So please, please correct me. Let me know what you're thinking. Subscribe to this channel. Please subscribe to my newsletter. I don't know who's up right now, but thank you. If, if Bob's here, thank you in the chat room. I will see everybody uh, tomorrow. Thank you all. Did I remind you to stay strong and protect the weak? I don't remember if I told you that. Well, if I... Okay, bye.